Thank you, Bryce. So today with us, we have um, my former employer, Jim White from uh, the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. He's the executive director there. And he believes in the power of nonprofits and is deeply committed to social change. He's worked in the nonprofit sector, both domestically and internationally for many, many years. Look at his gray hair. He has a passion for creating systemic change through collaboration of nonprofits with the public and private sectors. Through NAO, Jim is proud to help build the capacity leadership and the voice of Oregon's vibrant nonprofit sector. He's also worked and uh, led many humanitarian and recovery responses to disasters all over the world and in the U.S. Before NAO, he worked at Mercy Corps, both overseas and in Oregon, most recently as the vice president of program operations, responsible for their overseas programs in 42 countries. Jim has also worked for the International Organization for Migration and the American Red Cross. He's earned a BS, I'll tell you, in engineering technology from Temple University and an MA in Central Eurasian Area Studies from Indiana University. Please welcome Jim White. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for that. Can you all hear me okay? Can I see like a thumbs up? I'm just curious about the room in particular. Yep, okay, I see a bunch of thumbs. Great, wonderful. Well, it's great to be with you all here today. Thank you. And thanks for accommodating a virtual and a uh, in-person environment. That's great practice to see uh, that, you know, you have that opportunity to join the Rotary both ways. Um, what I wanted to do was give you an overview of just basically what the nonprofit sector in Oregon is currently comprised of. And then I want to talk you through a little bit of what has happened in the last two years in particular and where our nonprofit sector is now. As Amy mentioned in, in reading out my bio there, um, I'm, a, I'm a very strong believer in sort of the three legs of the stool of a thriving, vibrant civil society. When you have a public sector doing its job appropriately, when you have a private sector driving innovation and creating jobs, and when you have this third sector, if you will, the, the nonprofit sector, that um, is private actors, but doing public good. So they, in some ways, uh, sit between, in many ways, the private sector and the public sector. In Oregon and across the United States, nonprofits are, are corporations. So they are registered corporations, but they have a public benefit or in some cases, a mutual benefit uh, categorization. So they're not there for to, to, to pay out to, you know, to create payout to shareholders. They're there to serve a public interest that meets a charitable or a mutual benefit cause. And in Oregon, we have about 33,000 total nonprofits. And, and as I just mentioned, those sort of break into two main categories of charitable public benefit nonprofits and mutual benefit. So a membership organization. I don't know about the Forest Grove Rotary, but many rotaries, many um, eagles, odd fellows, granges, groups like that are what are called mutual benefit organizations. So they, they exist to serve their members. Um, Online uh, uh, on point credit union is a mutual benefit. Some uh, HOAs, the the you know your homeowners association, can actually be a mutual benefit organization. Um, those other organizations. So there's about well, in fact, I looked it up today. So on the Department of Justice, who regulates charitable activities in Oregon, as of just a few hours ago, there are twenty two thousand eight hundred and sixty two charitable nonprofits in Oregon. Those are the ones that are registered either as what, what under tax law is classified as 501c3, if you've ever heard that classification, or they are um, they would normally meet those charitable um, requirements, but they're not yet recognized by the federal government, by the IRS as a 501c3. So they're determined in Oregon as a public benefit corporation. So 22,000, over 22,000 of these uh, organizations here in Oregon. My organization, the Nonprofit Association of Oregon, exists to serve that particular group of nonprofits, to help them do their work better. These are corporations. Many of them are very small. In fact, the vast majority of nonprofits in Oregon 
have less than $50,000 in annual revenue and expenses and don't have any staff. They're all volunteer. There's only of that 22,000, about 8,500 8, have staff. Um, so very large number of nonprofits are all volunteer. And that's what's so wonderful about our society is to see that nonprofits, in my opinion, are, are sort of the way that people show care about their community, right? They're, they're you know, that just listening to the announcements earlier, you know, organizing to go do uh, uh, cleanup on alongside a roadway or organizing to do other activities around the holidays to make sure, you know, people are kept warm and safe and, and have a, uh, a good meal for the holidays. Um, there's a lot of charities and nonprofits who do that work. Um, and we're lucky that we have so many here in Oregon. In fact, some would say we have a disproportional number as compared to our total population of, of charitable organizations here in Oregon. I, I've had you know, sort of debates with people through the years of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Can it be confusing? Absolutely. You can you know, have a whole bunch of different food pantries, but we're lucky in that there are, there tend to be some um, interrelatedness and collaboration between these organizations so that where they do touch each other, there's some level of coordination. Um, all the food pantries, in fact, in Oregon, or almost all the food pantries, I should say, in Oregon are uh, interrelated through a network that the Oregon Food Bank um, runs. And then they're related with all the other food banks in the United States up through an organization called Feeding America. So in a number of specific cases, we see that interrelatedness that, that these nonprofits seek with both each other, but also with the public and private sectors. So what I wanted to give you then was just sort of an overview of this is where, what, this is what nonprofits are. An important part and an interesting part of the nonprofit sector here in Oregon is before COVID restrictions. So I wanna be clear, this is before 2020. Um, there were over 200,000 people in Oregon employed by nonprofits paying about $10 billion in annual payroll a year. That constituted about 12.4% of the private workforce in Oregon, which technically made nonprofit employment larger than manufacturing in Oregon. So this is a very robust sector in Oregon, not only from the good work that it does that these individual organizations do, but also just purely from an economic standpoint, there's a lot of people who are employed or were employed, and that's what we're gonna get into a little bit here um, by the sector and certainly you know, starting with COVID and then a whole, you know, bunch of other things that have happened through 2020 and 2021, there's been a significant drop, as you can imagine, in that employment and those numbers that I just gave you. So the, there, we're seeing some improvements, but let me jump into a little bit of a presentation I wanted to kind of give you around where we are since 2020 in Oregon. And we are gonna have a Q&A session at the end here. So if you do have any questions, just kind of jot them down for now, or you can put them in the chat and Amy can pelt me with them later or uh, however she wants to do it. But I'm gonna try and go through this quickly to, to um, give you as much time for Q&A. So hopefully I can share my screen now. Ah, great. Can everybody see this? this yeah, there you go. Great. And can the folks, it looks like I can see in the room that it's up on the TV screen there. So, um, so again, I'm with the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. I am the executive director. I've been in this job for almost 10 years now. It'll be 10 years this October. I can't believe it myself. Um, and there's my contacts if anybody wants to reach out um, and you can look up our website, be happy to have you uh, check us out online and, and hear about what we do and how we work. So, Hopefully this will advance. Huh. Well, that's interesting. It doesn't advance during the screen share. Um, oh, there it goes. It just takes a moment. Okay. So 
nonprofits during and since 2020. Um, what we've seen coming into 2020 and certainly through 2020 into 2021 are several big issues that I wanted to talk about. They hit society broadly, but they have particular impacts on the nonprofit sector. So there have been changes, I'm, I'm classifying these as changes in what is really sort of a societal compact, if you will, with you know, people to their community, people to their government, people to each other. And those relationships that have bound us together for you know, well over 200 years, but in addition, well before that, um, the, the, the relationships that we have and the expectations that we have of how we treat each other in public and in private. And there have been significant challenges and changes and under, you know, a, a shifting of that relationship. So I, I wanna name that because that is gonna feed into the way that nonprofits are impacted in particular. We had, as you all know, and we're still reeling from in many ways, this global pandemic um, that, that has gone, not only all of us were thinking, you know, it's 2020 and this is gonna go away and it went through 2021 and it's still not gone away. And we still have serious jeopardy for, you know, many members of our community. So this global pandemic is unlike anything that most of us have witnessed before. Um, I, I don't know if we have any survivors of the Spanish flu on the call. I doubt it. Um, but it's, it's been something that has been significant in its impact of the, the restrictions, the closures, the impact that has on, on uh, mental health and employment and all of the services that these nonprofits are actually trying to deliver. Um, we hear a lot about frontline workers and certainly we can you know, quickly understand well, that's the person who might be pumping my gas, or that's the person who I'm buying something from at a, at a Fred Meyer, or that's the person who is um, at, at those hospitals. But many nonprofits serve a lot of these frontline roles in our society, and they couldn't not do their work, right? They're, but for them, there are, there are particular parts of our society and our communities who go unserved in a very significant way, meaning up into, you know, people who are not checked on for, for welfare checks, people who are not uh, receiving meals through organizations like Meals on Wheels, people who are, you know, in some kind of a, uh, a, a supported care facility for developmentally challenged folks. You know, all of those things need to continue to happen regardless of whether there's restrictions in a pandemic. So many nonprofits, particularly the health and human service oriented nonprofits had to have special exemptions for their staff to continue to work all through that period. And that wore a lot of people down. We had as an, in addition, as you know, a deepening awareness and a crisis in understanding around racial and societal uh, divides and injustices. We saw um, a lot of that played out right here in Oregon and in Portland, but not only in Portland, you know, certainly in other parts of Oregon as well. And that continues to reverberate through our communities and through our society. And also in this time period, we had um, a building, I think, a building set of likely climate-driven devastating disasters that are hitting Oregon that are causing us to have to really rethink the way that we are going to continue to build in Oregon, the way that we're gonna to continue to have uh, communities live in certain ways and years and years long uh, recovery for those particular towns and communities that were directly hit by either the 2020 Labor Day fires or the, you know, several of the fires that have happened since like the, the bootleg fire down in Klamath and, and Lake counties just this last summer. And these things are not going away. There is nothing that we're doing right now that is necessarily going to mitigate us having a terrible fire season again this, this summer. And so we're seeing government and a lot of nonprofits implement these programs um, trying to figure out what are they going to do to continue to combat these issues into the future and how do we continue to help 
communities recover from what's already happened. I, I don't know if any of you have been down to um, Phoenix or Talent since that those areas were burned in that Alameda fire in Labor Day of 2020. But I mean, it, it just went right up the main street. You know, it, it was amazing. I mean, just, you know, block after block after block of homes and uh, businesses burned. And, you know, that's a town probably not all that dissimilar from Forest Grove in terms of size, I mean, except maybe for the university being there. Um, it's, it, it's not unheard of that this won't happen in other parts of our community. And so we've got to be more prepared for this. So all of these issues impacted nonprofits in many ways. But what I wanted to do is really drill down on just a particular few of them today. And then we can kind of talk about, and you can ask questions about others that I may not have mentioned. But um, these nonprofits, these charitable nonprofits in particular, have been navigating a constant state of change over the last three years, basically, since 2020. Um, I think some key areas to watch are around the most precious resource anybody, any corporation, the government, any of us have in community is the people, right? So paying attention to what's happening with the people is vital. This issue of discourse um, and, and, you know, in many cases, a too divisive discourse, the engagement that, that is still happening with with each other in society and with um, the government in society is an interesting connection point or, or breakage point that we're seeing. And an overall trust in civil society, what's happening with our key institutions of society and how do community um, members either trust or don't trust those things. Uh, anymore and who who still has that trust and what can be done to use some of that continued connection that those organizations who've retained trust can help to rebuild uh, our, our community better. And then of course this engagement with, with government as I said on many on many different levels, um, the way that community and particularly nonprofits are engaging with government is, has been a, a source of trying to navigate some interesting dynamics, particularly in the last two and a half years. So let me start first with the people. Um, we have a situation now where the mental health, the, the wellness and mental health, I mean, we have the impacts not only from the COVID, but as I mentioned, the, the you know, for, for, for those people who've been historically marginalized in community, this opening up of wounds in, a, in a, such a way and a voice now given for them to express things that they had not been able to talk about, that we are seeing a deep, deep um, concern uh, and, and a, a diagnosable level of burnout and mental health issues across our society. I mean, we all just and, and are still going through what is a traumatic event, right? A global pandemic that caused all kinds of breakages in our normal relationships. That wellness and mental health has had incredibly dire impacts on communities being able to gather, um, you know, a, a, a a small theater company being able to put on their productions, be, you know, every year everybody loves, you know, being a part of that community theater and it can't do anything and it hasn't been able to for the last two years. Um, that has, there, there's a reason that I, I have an issue with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're familiar with that, where it's just sort of like food, water, shelter at the bottom, and then slowly you build up to these more, uh, uh, more ethereal, issues of, of human endeavor, you know, your, your personal feelings, your, your uh, sense of self and wellness. Um, I think too many times in, in society, the, the nonprofit sector is being asked to prioritize only the, the health and wellness and, and those issues. And we're not seeing enough investment in those things that make our society a great place to be, right? It, it, yes, you want to have good health care and you want to have um, 
uh, a regular flow of, of food products and goods, you know, that, that the economy or, or you know, your, your supply chain is supplying. But at the same time, you don't want to live in a country or in a community where there's no art, there's no concerts, there's no theater, there's no singing, there's no beauty, um, there's no caring for nature. I, you know, as Amy mentioned at the top there in introducing me, I worked all over the world, a lot of different countries around the world. And interestingly, you know, there's a reason people want to come to America because they recognize that promise, not only the economic future for their, for their, um, for their children, uh, for themselves and for their children, but also that, that freedom of being able to express yourself whether it's artistically, whether it's through writing or uh, you know, free thought, poetry, whatever it is that they might wanna be doing, that has been a mainstay of what has made America a great place and, and Oregon a great place. And so having the level of restriction and the level of people being um, disconnected from each other over the last two years has had significant impacts on, on the people issue. And that is both for nonprofits, that equals both the employees or volunteers of these organizations and as well the program participants of these organizations. Um, that has had enormous impacts as well on employment. The closure certainly we just actually participated in a national survey um, with our partner organization, the National Council of Nonprofits. We just, it just closed and reported out in late December. And we're going to be preparing a, a summary of how this impacted Oregon. I was, I'm happy to say that, you know, with our organization interconnected into this, we had the second highest response rate in the United States. Um, and that's for little old Oregon that only has 1% of the total population of the United States. So I, I feel like I did my job anyway, my team did their job. Um, but in that response, this was about workforce in the nonprofit sector. In that response, which was over, over 100 respondents here in Oregon, nonprofit organizations, not individuals, but the actual organizations responding to this, 43% of the respondents from Oregon indicated they, they had more than 20% vacancies in their organization. And of that 43%, 9% of them had more than 30% vacancies. Well, I think anybody who's run a business or been part of any kind of a, of a structure knows you, you know, you're, you're gonna run people down if you're working with only two thirds of the total workforce you need to deliver whatever the thing you're, is, you're doing. And certainly in the nonprofit sector, that, that's you know, the same as it would be in the for-profit or public sector. And so employment has been a huge issue for nonprofits. And the, the biggest issue that was stated was salaries. Three quarters of the respondents to this survey indicated that the, that they, they can't compete with the, 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 the salary market as it, as it is right now. They're just not getting respondents to their jobs. Um, interestingly then, you, they didn't have to just pick one or the other. So I don't want to say, I, I just said, you know, three quarters of them said this and then 30%, because you could choose more than one, 30% of the respondents said that childcare was a, was a significant issue. It was in fact the second biggest issue because with these restrictions, you know, caregivers are having to stay home, you know, wh whomever the, the, the person in the family is who's do giving that care, they're staying home, they're then not able to work, and it's cheaper for them not to work than it is for them to pay or find, if they're even lucky to find, a caregiver for children. So that's become a huge issue. Um, nearly tying, just a little bit less, at 27% said that their job vacancy issue was driven largely by vacant by vaccinations and restrictions. The the whether their staff could not or did not want to get vaccinations, or whether it was um, continued restrictions on um, how they can gather. Um, so we have a real challenge here in Oregon in our employment across every different sector. I certainly understand. 
but particularly in this nonprofit sector, it's been um, it's been you know a, a significant significant um, player in how these organizations are able to continue and work. The last issue I wanted to talk about relative to people is the leadership ecosystem itself has been diminished. And it's been diminishing over years, but we're seeing now, um, many of you probably know that it's back about probably five years ago, maybe more, you know, Oregon was listed regularly on these realtor sites as the net influx state in the, in the country. So everyone else was wanting to move here to live in Oregon. While some of that is true, we're seeing some signs of reversal of that. People who started to, they came here, they took leadership positions in nonprofits at a very high level, very important organizations, sort of what I would call main street organizations. They're but for them, an important thing is not done in that community. And they're only sticking around for two, three, four years. This has worn out some of the key sort of next generation people and we're seeing, as I think you've probably all heard this, you know, or read about it in, in the media, the great retirement where those people who had been possibly hanging on for years are finally saying, that's it, I'm retiring, I'm not continuing with this organization. And there's not then a person to, to hand off to. So the leadership ecosystem for the nonprofit sector is um, challenged here in Oregon. So that's unfortunately the bad news about the people side. Um, I wanna to turn to this issue of discourse, engagement and trust in civil society. We partner every year with uh, another national organization called Independent Sector. It's, it's one of the largest sort of groups like us that does um, support to the charitable benefit nonprofits. They do it at the national level. We do it here in Oregon. They, the issues that we're seeing is on the one hand, we see a more divisive discourse happening. Um, I put here sort of the divide, if you will, between rural and urban is becoming wider and more of a, of a fulcrum to pull us apart rather than find commonality of places where it should bring us together. Um, we're also, though, interestingly seeing a level of engagement that's increasing, but it's along those very striated, specific belief, political belief systems. So greater engagement, but more divisive. Um, and when I mention the trust in civil society, what I mean there is when, when we partner with the independent sector on this, this report they do every year, and I'll send it later to, to Amy so you can all take a look at it. Um, it, it. We have a lessening and lessening trust that Americans feel in the main institutions of society. And that includes, of course, you can imagine the government, but also the for-profit sector, also religious, institutions, also the media. And what was interesting in the latest two versions of this trust in civil society report that independent sector did was that the nonprofit sector, while we have also gone down in our trust rating as well through 2020 and 2021, it was literally by one or two percentage points and we're way, way, way above anyone else. So short form is people trust the local rotary. <laughs> people trust the local food bank. People trust the local um, group who's bringing them together and giving them a sense of community or meeting direct community needs. They don't trust their government. They don't trust the media. They don't trust, you know, even it, the waning trust in religious institutions. And so... In the nonprofit sector, what we're paying attention to is we need to figure out what is our proper role in possibly bringing this back and recreating some of these connections because we need people to trust government. We need people to trust the institutions of, of the, of the, of the you know, society. So that's what I mean by this issue as being one that is really you know, kind of causing the nonprofit sector you know, movement back and forth and, and lots of turmoil. 
The other, the final thing I wanted to state here is engagement with government itself from the nonprofit sector to government. So this is not so much about private citizens engaging with the government or how they, what their beliefs are about government, but with all of the stimulus, the, the COVID money, then later the, the, um, the, the, the ARPA money, if you're familiar with that, the, um, the wildfire uh, relief money and recovery money. There is a desire for government, particularly here in Oregon, to engage with these nonprofits, particularly smaller community-based organizations, right? The smaller, the better, because they're the ones who are truly really in and connected in with that particular community. But they're asking them to retain the ability to report and function as if they're these large contracted nonprofits. And so you've got this situation where the government, and you've probably read about this in the media, the government can't get money out the door. This money is available, right? It was made available months or even years ago, and it is stuck in the system because they can't qualify the organizations they want to give it to or the organizations they want to give it to can agree to take on the level of compliance requirements that the government wants to force on them. And, and I'm a big believer in, you know, there, there are certain things nonprofits have to do and comply with. We teach this all the time as an organization, as part of our role. And at the same time, we have seen our need to intervene multiple times with government here in Oregon to explain to them, you don't, that, that's not how to interpret that particular 22 CFR from the federal government. That's, that's ridiculous. You don't need receipts for that. What you need is you need, you know, a certain level of, of, uh, of sensibility and understanding how generally accepted accounting of principles, principles are applied to these organizations. That engagement with government has been very difficult for organizations, and it has caused a number of organizations to get into some really serious problems. So there's, there's this you know, issue of how do you even move money here in Oregon that needs to be solved. So I'm going to stop there. Amy's texting me saying, shut up. So um, I'm no. going to stop there, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you all uh, hit me with any questions you might have. So it looks like if you're on Zoom, please unmute yourselves and ask questions. And if there's any questions from the room, they'll be typed into the chat. So they're working on one from the room. So bear with us, Jim. And I realized that was fast and furious. So I, I hope I hope folks were able to stay stay on there. Do these numbers include churches as nonprofits? Yes. So that twenty two thousand um, that the the twenty two thousand eight hundred sixty two do include churches. So churches, houses of worship, in uh, under IRS code are oftentimes classified as five hundred one c three religious organizations. And so, yeah, the, the, they're, they're, they would be included then in those. It's interesting because the Department of Justice, their, their special little section, the charitable affairs section that regulates charities in Oregon, um, as you can imagine, has very specific rules and regulations how they can or cannot regulate houses of worship as compared to the other kinds of nonprofits. So even, even within the 501c3 structure, there are different kinds of 501c3. An example would be the Oregon Community Foundation is a 501c3. They're a public foundation, a community foundation. Um, Murdoch Charitable Trust over in Vancouver or Meyer uh, Memorial Trust here in, in Portland are private foundations. They're also 501c3s, but they can't act the same way that OCF can. So it's an interesting, interesting dynamic, the different types of 501c3 that exist. Other, other questions or thoughts or comments? I 
I don't see any. Oh, wait, one more. One more. Coming in. Wow. <laughs> I like this. Any tips on avoiding scammers posing as nonprofits? Yes. So um, back a number of years ago, Amy was, I think, a part of this. You, you, were, you were part of this whole thing. Um, we worked actually with the Department of Justice. I, I was a little chagrined, I would say, when it came to NAO. And I noticed that the Attorney General's office would publish, and it would unfortunately get in the media this way, the 20 worst nonprofits in Oregon. Right. And I was like, and it was right. They would always publish it right around the end of the year when a lot of nonprofits are raising money. And it was a, you know, it was a useful list in that these 20 nonprofits, but I pointed out to them, this was in like 2013. I pointed out to them that like of those 20 that you listed, only two of them are actually registered here in Oregon are actually domestically registered. So an organization that is registered, let's say, that is, that is domiciled in Seattle, for instance, is considered foreign registered if they register to fundraise here in Oregon, right? Whereas a domiciled organization in Forest Grove is a domestic nonprofit in Oregon, right? So my point was this, is that of this 20 worst nonprofits in Oregon, only two of them were actually domiciled here in Oregon, stop letting those other 18 raise money here, right? Don't let them work here if you don't want that. So we worked together with the Department of Justice here and we successfully passed legislation through the Oregon uh, legislature. Oregon is the only state in the country that has this, that a nonprofit that raises money here in Oregon, whether they're domestically uh, uh, located here or not, must show over a span of three years, how they're spending that money to a certain percentage level here in Oregon for the for the for the for the good of the the, the programming uh, uh, for the people. So it it caused pretty quickly those eighteen other scammers to get out of the system. And now I don't think DOJ even publishes that list anymore because they were successful in scaring away those scammers who would set up an organization and basically they were raising money, but then they would give $500 to, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a cancer patient, you know, a, a young child or to a fireman's widow or something like that. And so the other scams I would say is that I would really only encourage you give to organizations that you know, or you volunteer with, or you have some level of trust with, right? So I realize that you may see something in the news and it moves you to be involved with that. You should look and see what is that organization actively doing in response to the issue that's moving you to want to give them some funds and decide that that's then how you wanna use your money. But um, yeah, there, there are more because of the digital age, there are more people out there who are, who are scamming, unfortunately. Um, you're more than welcome to check and I will send it in a link to Amy to share with you. You can check and see the registration status of a charity here in Oregon on the Department of Justice website. It's open to the public. So that's another way to see did that request that you got from an individual solicitation, is that organization even a real organization here in Oregon? Because a lot of these scammers are not even here and they're not even real organizations. It's just somebody wants you to send them $200 or whatever. So those are my tips on avoiding scammers. And... All right, looks like Bryce is taking it over control. All right, well, thank you all and I'm gonna to, to mute myself unless you need me for anything else. Thanks, Jim.